good evening, everyone. Good evening. Th thank you very much for inviting us here today. I'm going to start off with a question. Before this talk was arranged, how many had previously heard about mercy ships? Yeah. Well, that majority, that, that, that's unusual, but uh, usually church groups have a better knowledge than most people. I'm going to start off by telling you about the history of mercy ships, how it all started and how we got involved. Uh, we'll then show you a 10-minute DVD, which shows the sort of work mercy ships can do. Then June will give the latest perspective, and I'll wrap things up at the end. Well, most of the ships were started in 1978 by an American called Don C. Stevens, who you will see on the screen shortly. I believe it was only in his 30s at the time when he had this remarkable vision of providing the world with an ocean-going liner, fully equipped as a floating hospital, which could go out to some of the poorest countries of the world and carry out free operations and all other medical services for people who otherwise would not be able to obtain them. And the ship, or ships now, because there's two of them, uh, spend most of their time around the west coast of Africa, where there are some very poor and deprived countries. And for literally millions of people in West Africa, perhaps their only hope in the whole lifetime of getting any medical treatment is if the most ship comes to their country. So think about it for a moment. If during the whole of your lives you'd never had access to a doctor, a dentist, an optician, a chemist, a hospital, an ambulance, drugs, medicine, what sort of state would we all be in? How many of us would still be here even? Uh, certainly without the NHS I'd be a cripple, I'd be in a wheelchair and although the NHS may not be perfect, be very glad you've got it. Now Don had some huge hurdles to overcome before his dream could become a reality but he did have what you might call a special asset which I'll describe shortly. The first problem is finding a suitable ship. Well most charities probably start off with fairly small beginnings and as they start to prosper so they can expand this option wasn't open for Dan. Don. He couldn't start off with a rowing boat, could he? It had to be a proper ocean-going liner. And he heard about an Italian ship called the Victoria. It was 25 years old. Shipping lines were getting a bit old-fashioned, a bit past its sell-by date, and they wanted to get rid of it. But it's still seaworthy. Somehow, Don and his friends managed to negotiate a purchase price based purely on its scrap value. It was actually worth a lot more. But the shipping line, I guess, was sympathetic to his needs. He said, OK, you can have it for scrap value. Even so, that scrap value is one million US dollars. And that was 78, what's that worth now? Eight, nine, ten million, a huge amount. And this was for starters. So he wrote to lots and lots of international banks asking for a loan so he could buy the ship and start working on it. A few were a bank manager and this stranger came into her office and said, look, I know nothing about shipping. I know almost nothing about medicine. I'm buying 12,000 tons of scrap metal. Give me a million dollars. He's shown the door pretty quickly, wouldn't you? And that's what they all did, apart from one bank, the Union Bank of Switzerland. They agreed to lend on the money. So that was the first problem out of the way. The second problem were repairs. Obviously, the shipping line, knowing they were going to get rid of the ship, would have carried out the minimum number of repairs just to keep the customers happy. No point spending a lot of money on a ship they're going to get rid of, particularly if they're only going to get scrap value for it. And we met a lady some years ago who'd been out at the Greek shipyard when the ship arrived. She said it was in a pretty rough condition. It did need quite a lot of work doing to it. But somehow Don and his friends got this work done. Having done that, parts of the ship needed converting. Had to create theater, operating theatres, dental surgery, nice surgery, wards, recovery rooms, a pharmacy, etc. And again, somehow they managed to get this work done. Having done that, the ship then needed equipping. Well, I'm not a medical person, but can you imagine how much equipment you would need to fit out a complete working hospital? It's all going to be very expensive stuff. It's all state-of-the-art. That's all that's available. But again, somehow they managed to get the necessary equipment. At this stage, the ship was renamed Anastasis, which is a Greek word meaning resurrection, very appropriate. And the ship of this size requires a crew of about, about 300 or so, but there's a catch. Everyone, from the captain downwards, had to be a volunteer. No one would get a wage. And not only that, they all had to pay for their food and accommodation on board the ship. Quite a tall order. But they got the necessary crew. The final big problem was staff, medical staff and other staff as well. Same rules applied. All had to be volunteers, all had to pay for their food and accommodation on the ship. But they got the necessary staff. Now the reason most ships work, it's special asset, in my view perhaps the only reason it can work, is that although it's by no means compulsory, the vast majority of people who work with or for most of ships are committed Christians. And they are very happy to be doing what they see as the Lord's work.
In addition to the Life Save, the Hope Restored, Mercy Ships is providing people with training and tools. Is there a better way to communicate the gospel when one has been blind, but now they can see? It is that gospel that is intricately right in the middle of the work of Mercy Ships. So how do we get involved? Well, I'm a member of Princess Richard Rotary Club. And back in 2003, was it? 2003, yeah, 21 years ago. Uh, June and I went to a weekend Rotary conference. And at the time, I was the incoming international chairman of the club, and I was looking for some new international charities to support. So on the Saturday morning, we made our way over to the lecture theatre. And in the foyer outside, various charities had set up their stores, including one called Message, which I'd never heard of before, even though I'd been involved in some charity work. At the time, I thought it was a training disabled youngster to operate, operate a sailing ship, but that's a different charity altogether. Anyway, I picked up a brochure and started to read through it. And as I read through it, I thought, I suddenly realised how wrong I'd been in my assumption. But the more I read, the more I thought, what a clever idea, what a brilliant concept. I think the club might be interested in supporting this. So we then went into the lecture theatre and there was a talk there by someone from Mercy Ships. And by the end of that talk, June and I came out of the theatre and we were both so moved by what we'd seen and heard that morning that quite independently of each other, we had both decided we had to do something. Doing nothing was not an option. So we did. We contacted the head office in Stevenage, or some people call it St Evanage, <laughs> and said, what can we do? At the time, there's nothing we could do. The ship was out in Africa doing its wonderful work. But later in the year, it was going to be docked in Sunderland for about two and a half weeks, during which time we'd take on some supplies, perhaps a change of staff and crew, but also to give publicity tours of the ship to the general public. Well, this is ideal for us, because June's from the North East, so she could act as my interpreter. <laughs> And her mum still lived there, so we got free accommodation, so absolutely perfect. So we signed up straight away. And this is our first real involvement with the charity. <clears throat> it is a unique organisation. Everyone is truly an equal. There's no hierarchy, there's no pecking order. We've seen the captain clear the way a deckhand's dinner place. It's that sort of place you do whatever job is asked of you, and you're quite happy to be doing it. A lot of time I was on car parking duty, also on security at the dockside. <laughs> Obviously, docks are potentially dangerous areas, so no one under the age of 18 was allowed on without an adult. And right next to Sunderland Docks, some huge 1960s multi-storey council flats. And several of the local youth from there were determined to get on board the ship. And this puzzled me for a while. I thought, you know, do they really want to go to the next service? I rather doubt it. Um, but then I realised that from the quayside, on the promenade deck, they could see this huge container of Coke cans. That was the attraction, that was the law, so I'd get on and nick a few. And they try all ways to get on board. They'd tell lies about their ages, they'd hang on to backs of dinner wagons and they hoped we wasn't, wouldn't see them. I mean, not only was I lied to, I was spat at, I was kicked, had stones and broken glass thrown at me. And one little lad, bless his soul, tried to set five in trousers as a cigarette lighter. <laughs> he was only 13, what was he doing with a cigarette lighter? <laughs> it was all good fun, thoroughly enjoyed it. But the best part of all was going around the tour of the ship with the general public. There'd be someone who'd worked on the ship, usually a medical person, who would take the group round, show them how the ship works, show them where places were. And I'd bring up the rear to make sure no one got lost or if little Jimmy wanted a toilet because show them where there was one. And sometimes, if it's a, particularly if it's a fairly big group, you're going this, down this narrow ship's companion way. And the people at the rear couldn't really hear what the guide was saying, they're just too far away. So I was able to fill them in on the details and tell them how it all worked. I got all sorts of undeserved compliments from people saying, well, you're doing a fantastic job. And I said, well, not really, I'm just a shore-based volunteer. It's those who work on the ships. They're the ones that perform the miracles. They're the ones that deserve the praise. But even so, the feel-good factor of working for those ships are terrific. We thoroughly enjoyed our time there. So that was 2003. 2004, we did the same thing again, but this time at Liverpool Docks. I don't know if you've ever, any of you have been to Liverpool Docks. Worthwhile. It's a fascinating area. Lots of grade one and two listed buildings. And it just so happened to coincide with the tour ships race, which was based there for a few days. So you've got all these beautiful old sailing ships, thousands of the general public, terrific atmosphere. And of course, we met some people we met the previous year. And some of them said to us, look, you've been involved for a year now. You know what message ships are all about. You really ought to go out to Sierra Leone. <laughs> we thought, not likely. <laughs> it's hot, it's humid, it's desperately poor. Doesn't sound like a fun place to spend your holidays. Yeah, we're quite happy in our own comfort zone in the UK. Thanks very much. So we resisted the temptation quite easily. But following year 2005, 
British Rotary took Messerships on board as its chosen charity for the year. And coupled with this were what were called the Rotary Mission Challenges, whereby teams of Rotarians were invited to go out to Sierra Leone to work on a building project. Well, this is right up my street from the building surveyor. And I thought, you know, we are meant to go. So after a fairly brief discussion, somewhat in fear and trepidation, we decided we would go. And June will tell you a bit more about that. But I think now we'll show you the 10-minute DVD. The, the title of the track is Fellow Prisoners. Because it's about people who, through no fault of their own, are effectively prisoners of their own bodies due to their illnesses and deformities. Uh, we make no apologies for the images that you'll see. This is what it's like in West Africa. We've been there twice, we've seen it for ourselves. Uh, the problems they have out there just don't exist in the West. Some of the facts and figures are <coughs> quoted are a bit out of date. This is a 20-year-old DVD, but the message is as relevant as ever.
I'm on location in Sierra Leone. The World Health Organization, WHO, ranks 192 nations. Sierra Leone finds itself at the very bottom. It is the poorest nation in the world. Well, how poor is poor? What does that mean in comparable terms for us? In the developed world, the per capita income is just less than $20,000 per person. But here in the needy parts of the world, it's as little as 200 to 300, depending upon the nation. There's one doctor for about 450 people in the Western world, Europe or North America, and here in West Africa, it's about one doctor for 15,000 in Sierra Leone. It's even greater. But let's look at dentists. That's perhaps an even greater indication of how poor is poor. What does it mean? We have one dentist for every 1,500 people in the developed world. Here, for a comparison, in the neediest areas of the world, there's one dentist for up to 150,000 people. And because I'm convinced that the spiritual reality of life is often the cause of the physical suffering in life, let's look at this part of the world where the message of a loving God is so rarely heard. Mercy Ship's primary calling is to bring hope and healing. And that's only possible if we understand the love of God. We're here to bring hope and healing. We are making a difference. Some of the stories, the lives have been changed forever and for eternity will bring joy to your heart. Listen as we explain some of those stories. The tumor on Patrick's face began as a tiny spot close to his teeth. For 18 years, he had endured the rituals of native medicine men and disappointments from different doctors. He received news about a giant floating hospital, a mercy ship that was in his city, and he attended the medical screening. He was accepted for surgery, and Mercy Ship surgeon Dr. Gary performed two operations to remove a three and a half pound tumor. The change was remarkable. These surgeries freed Patrick from his prison of hopelessness and gave him joy. Deep in the heart of El Salvador, sisters Isabel and Elsa were both born with club feet. The younger sister Elsa was just learning how to walk on her disfigured feet when Dr. Tim from Mercy Ships first met her. Isabel's feet had grown completely backward because she did not have access to medical care for 11 years. Following Dr. Tim's successful surgery, a beaming Isabel could do the things other girls her age do, chores around the house, go to school, and play with shoes on her feet. Isabel's chain that kept her from walking properly was loose because Mercy Ships reached out and made a difference in her life. Malachi lived with his parents and several siblings in one rented room. The highlight of his day had been being pushed and pulled through the dusty streets while sitting in a cardboard box. Malachi, like his mother and two of his brothers and sisters, was virtually blind. Mercy ships operated on Malachi and restored his sight. When Malachi looked into a mirror for the first time, he said, I'm a black, handsome boy. Malachi's chain of blindness had been broken by a skilled mercy ship surgeon. When Usman first arrived aboard a mercy ship with his mother, he was severely malnourished. He could not drink because of a cleft lip and palate. At about six months of age, tiny Usman weighed less than three pounds. Mercy Ship staff immediately placed him on a feeding program to gain weight in preparation for his life-saving operation. A few days after Dr. Geary operated, Usman and his mother returned home amid great rejoicing. Usman was wonderfully released from his prison of imminent death by Mercy Ships. Isabel, Malachi, and Usman were all prisoners of hopelessness until they came to a mercy ship. On board, they didn't suffer alone as they were cared for by loving and professional staff members. You see, on board a mercy ship, these fellow prisoners received back their hope and they were given a new life. Mercy ships brings hope and healing to hundreds of thousands of people each year, but we can't do it alone. By partnering with Mercy Ships, individuals, companies, 
and groups extend their own hands to the prisoners of hopelessness. I personally invite you to become a partner with the poor, the poor, partner with Mercy Ships, become an advocate for the poorest of the world's poor. Thank you for helping Mercy Ships bring hope and healing. Ladies and gentlemen, I guess that's made you sit and think if you're glad that you were born in the West. We might, as Ken said, might have problems with the, with the NHS. Sometimes I think, well, it'd be easier to save the money, get a flight out there and go on one of the Mercy <laughs> ships and have your operations out there. This is Africa, as you all might know, and the ships go down the west coast of Africa. And at the moment, there are two ships. The biggest one, the um, Global Mercy, is in Sierra Leone, where we were to start with. They were up in Senegal, and the Africa Mercy is down here in Madagascar. Madagascar is one of the fifth island, the fifth biggest island in the world, and they have the same problems that they have on the Mercy ship. When the ship's going out to one of these areas, an outreach team goes out, first of all, to let the people know that the ship is coming to their area. And when it went to the Congo, this one down here, the first day, there were 7,500 people waiting in the hope they could get on the ship. They now don't only recruit the crew and the medical staff, they also have security guys who will help to sort out the people. Only us British really know how to queue. They don't. And they're so desperate. And some of them might have walked in the hot sun all the way, perhaps for a couple of weeks, to reach a mercy ship where they can have their operations. And don't forget, they are poorly. They will have walked with the help of friends. When you saw the operations, Patrick with his horrible tumour, he'd had that for uh, 18 years. And when they removed it, it was three and a half pounds in weight. For all that time, it was like he'd carried two bags of sugar around his neck. Now, I think at this stage, I need to say that the culture out in Africa is that if you have a disease or a deformity, then the people believe that you are cursed, that you actually have a demon inside of you. And we saw this when we took a party of disabled youngsters to the beach. Um, they were so excited, all of them with crutches, and one little girl had a false leg, which she unscrewed before others could help her into the sea. They were having a wonderful time. And I said to the helper, um, Verity, she was called, I said, why are they so excited when they live so near? She said, I haven't got enough people to help to bring me down to the seaside so they can enjoy their day in safety. So because Rotarians were there and we were helping, they could all go. And I was looking after a little girl in a wheelchair. She had cerebral palsy, so couldn't move. But you could see her face, her face brightening as she looked out to watch the waves coming in. When a man walked along the beach, an African man, he said, what's this? Quite aggressively. Oh, that's a little girl enjoying her day out at the seaside. If you move out the way, she can see the waves coming in. No, he said, this is a demon. This is a demon. And he was quite aggressive and nasty in his approach. And as the others came round us, he went away, and we got them safely back on the bus to go back to their school. But that is what it is like out there. If you have something wrong with you, they don't want to live near you, smile at you, touch you, even smile and be, be your friend. So when these people come to the Mercy ship, it might be the first time they've really been welcomed into society. Patrick's tumour had been there all that time. We have tumours in this country, but they're operated on as soon as possible, as soon as we can have them diagnosed. Malachi, when he looks in the mirror, that's my favourite bit, and says, I am a handsome black boy. He's had his cataracts removed. 
His family couldn't see he was born and had the cataract. Say, I had mine removed during lockdown. And when I came home and looked at Ken, I said, oh, haven't you got a lot of laughter line wrinkles on his face? <laughs> it's worth the operation. Um, the little girl with her feet that were born back, she was born with her feet growing backwards. When we say to children in the schools, look down and imagine if your feet were born backwards. Fortunately, they managed to turn them around and she could have a normal life. And little Usman with cleft lip and palate, babies need to suckle. Well, they can't if their lips stuck up there. Again, some babies are born like that in this country, in the West, but again, they're operated on as soon as possible. Poor little Usman was only three pounds in weight when he reached six months old. Fortunately, thank goodness, he could come to a mercy ship and have his operations. The mercy ship goes out and stays for nine to 10 months in whichever place they go to to start with. Perhaps like Patrick, you might need two operations, so you need to come back to the ship. And when it sails and goes on somewhere else, if people still need help, a team will stay behind to stay with that person until they've recovered, or sadly, until they've passed on. The ship Ken talked about, the Anastasis, is this one. And every ship has a really special atmosphere on board because everyone is working towards the same purpose of helping other people. But there were only 30 beds on this ship for the patients. There was an eye surgery, dental surgery, a, um, a chemist area where someone would match the bloods. So if you volunteer for Mercy Ship, you're not only giving your time, energy, whatever skills you have, but also if the person on the operating theatre needs some blood, you might be asked to give your blood as well. It really is blood, sweat and tears. As Ken said, that one was uh, 1,000, no, 1 million. 1 million US dollars scrap. The next one, put this down here, the Africa Mercy. This one had 80 beds. That's a big improvement. Still not very much for a whole country of people. And would you believe this one cost £6 million to buy? And one lady bought it. Imagine getting up one day and thinking, what shall I do today? I know. I'll get my checkbook out. I'll write a cheque for how many noughts is that? £6 million. I'll buy a ship and then I'll just give it away to a charity. And she's Anne Glogue, who owns Stagecoach Travel. Next time you're out and about, watch the buses. She and her brother started that service up in Scotland. They became so prosperous and they really work hard that they floated on the stock exchange. She became mega rich. She's about my height. She's really dynamic. She's still supporting Mercy ships. The whole family worked very, very hard. The latest ship, the Global Mercy, is this one. It, it looks like a cruise liner. It's built like a cruise liner. We have no idea how much it costs to build but it's already been paid for. And not only is it a hospital ship with 200 beds for the patients and a special area with smaller bunk beds for poorly children, but it's also a teaching hospital. This is the ship when we went out, we were invited as speakers to go out to Rotterdam to see it before it sailed to Senegal. And it really is an absolutely fabulous ship. And on the ship, oh, Princess Anne, by the way, is the new patron. She was there the week before we went, and we thought, well, if she'd known we were going, she might have hung on to say hello. <laughs> also on the ship was Don and his wife, Diane. And we were invited to stay on for lunch, and Diane came in, and she said, first of all, how they began this programme. They'd met Mother Teresa, and Don said to her, I really admire the work you're doing. And she said, well, this is my life. I want to save these babies. So that, she said to Don, this is my dream life. What is your dream? Well, Don had a son. He had four children, but his son was disabled. And he knew in America they were finding it difficult. He's in Texas. Finding it difficult to get the right sort of treatment for his son. He thought, how much more difficult is it for those countries that are undeveloped, such as Africa? That's what started off his dream. And Diane said, we never dreamt that it could come so big that we'd have three ships eventually. So it was wonderful to meet them. Five billion of our brothers and sisters and family around the world lack access to safe and effective surgery. That statement alone explains why Mercy Ships exists. There's another operation that wasn't mentioned on the, on the DVD. And that's ladies who have a pregnancy. They go the whole eight and a half, nine months. They don't have any antenatal care. There are hospitals, but they can't afford them. 
and so any problems are not picked up on. They'll come to give birth and perhaps be in labour three or four days. And sadly, the way, they, the way the midwives in the villages try to help the ladies to have their babies finally, it doesn't work so well. They think you have to press down on the tummy to help the babies come out. Of course, that's not the right way. And the baby might be born dead and you've got that poor mother not only grieving for her baby, but in the process of doing that, she will have had holes um, or fistulas caused in the bladder. That means she will leak urine for the rest of her life unless she can get to a mercy ship. It's very uncomfortable. Uh, obviously, she washes every day, but she knows she's going to dribble again. We met a lady who would suffered with that condition for 40 years. Can you imagine going to bed thinking, I'll be well in the morning, but of course you wash. Her clothes become smelly. She cannot conceive at that point, and they still want to have big families. So the husbands don't want to make love to a smelly woman. Her clothes begin to stink as well. So the husbands throw them out, and some throw them out, and they go to live on the outskirts of the villages where they're allowed to use whatever washing water is available after other people have used it. That in itself is pretty horrid. And the first time we went, we met Sam, who was a male nurse, and his job was to take the, the wagon and go out into the villages to let the head man of the village know these ladies could come to a mercy <coughs> ship and have treatment so they could recover. Well, they could do this, and it takes 10 days to recover. It's a 20-minute operation. They're upended. It's a local anaesthetic. Their tears are fixed and mended. They need 10 days bed rest. In that time, they'll have literacy and numeracy lessons in the morning, and they will have craft lessons in the afternoons so they can go back to their communities and make little cushions or bags and stitch, stitch and sew so they can support themselves back in their communities. They also have some counselling. Some choose not to go back to the husband that threw them out in the first place. It's very easy for a man to divorce a lady out in West Africa. They simply have to say in front of witnesses, I divorce you three times, and that's it. I've have warned you. That men? <laughs> I've warned you. <laughs> Sadly, it doesn't work the other way. The women are still second class citizens out there. However, it's wonderful, and they're given, on the 10th day, when they're ready to go home, they're given a beautiful new outfit. Their self-esteem is restored. Some had felt like committing suicide because their lives were so awful, but the smiles on their faces and seeing them give a dance of joy is wonderful. It's another miracle of mercy ships. They can conceive again, but it means that mercy ships, um, oh, it means that we'll have to have a caesarean. Mercy ships gives them a card to say they will pay for a caesarean, whatever hospital they can manage to get to if they need to have that. So mercy ships, not only do they support the, the ones who need all the operations, and whatever operation is needed, mercy ships will provide it. 56 different countries are supporting mercy ships. So you have a vast variety of people volunteering. And I'm so glad that they do. Um, so the, 40, the 56 countries that support them, they send their volunteers in. Some go for a month, some go for six months. If you're a teacher, they'd like you to sign up for a year because there's a school on board as well from three to 16 year olds. And the, the ratio is one teacher to four children. And those kids are really confident. They know what they're doing. We went out there in 19, no, 2005. Yes, yes. And we went out to help build a, a, an extension to a clinic that already existed. There were two wards open on the clinic for those ladies to go to the clinic and have their repairs. Rather than take up time on the mercy ship, where they'd need 10 days, you can have two or three different operations in that time. So the idea was they would come to the clinic just outside Freetown and have their repairs. Ken being a sub building surveyor, I knew he'd be useful. My job when we went there, my background is education and psychology, I was making the concrete blocks for the building. And there we are with the picture here. It's amazing whatever skills you have, when you go out there, you discover you have other skills as well. We made 120 blocks one day before we stopped for lunch. And we had a lovely lunch that day. 
It really was amazing working in the hot sun with these handsome black guys who said more, more as we put the sand and the cement in the, in the tins that they turned <clears> out. And the guys would come round and take them back on site. You, know, the, you can look at the pictures afterwards. These are some of the ladies that were there in the hospital. They were so friendly and enjoyed meeting with us and we were helping them with their lessons. And you might, oh, we met one lady who, she was 32, and she was there having her repairs. She's in this picture down here. This is Hussein. He was crying. I said, would she mind if I picked him up? You can look at these afterwards. And he, she said, not at all. He was her 11th child, and she was only 32. But she only had seven children left. Infant mortality is high, and ladies still in Sierra Leone, one in 18 will die through childbirth. Be simply because they haven't got the know-how of how to bring the safe deliveries. We helped build the clinic, the, the extension to the clinic. <clears throat> we went out in the September. Ten more teams went out after us. I know it's a long way ahead, but that's the finished building, two stories high. So doctors and nurses could be on the top floor for their accommodation. And the ladies and their families, if they needed a rest before or after the operation, they could be on the ground floor. When I came home, I thought, I'm so glad I was part of that because then the ladies can have their repairs. Then I thought, hang on, what they need is a safe delivery in the first place. Anne Gloag, that bought the ship, she has taken over that clinic. She sent out midwives to train up the local midwives and she is still supporting it. It's now a maternity unit. So the ladies can go there and have their babies safely. So Mercy Ships also, um, also support the local schools. There's a school right near us. The children love their school uniforms. Here they are going to school. Um, but the headmaster would sometimes come out and say, go away, go home, to some who'd collected around the edges of the playground. Their parents couldn't afford the uniform or the notepad and pen they needed for their lessons. The children want to go to school. It's chalk and talk, teacher at the front, and they know if they have um, a career, if they have education, they can have a job when they grow up and support their families. It's important that they can get their careers going. Um, Mercy Ships also, ah oh yes, this is, this is a shanty town, how it looks, because after the 10 year civil war over the blood diamonds, the place was a wreck when we went there. Things are improving gradually, and thank goodness they are. And I will now hand you back to Ken. I'm gonna put on my favorite shirt. Excuse me. This is a shirt I bought out in Africa. Uh, do like bright colours, don't they? It's beautifully made. It's much more comfortable than anything I'd taken with me. And you can see them working at the side of the road with their treadle machines or hand sewing machines because there's no electricity. But they do a very good job. Um, now, our second visit, I bought six of these to take home. I sold a lot at the first talk we gave. This is the only one I've got. You can't have it. <laughs> uh, one African lady very, made a very telling remark. She said, you Europeans, you've got so much money. Why do you dress so shabbily? A bit of an eye opener. The, the language in Sierra Leone is English. That's what's taught in the schools. But all the locals speak a dialect called Creole, which even though based on English is quite unintelligible. And even when they're speaking English, they have different ways of saying things. For example, people in Sierra Leone are really happy but they're often gladdy. Instead of saying, how are you? They say, how de body? And the reply is, de body fine. <laughs> so we're all going to do that, aren't we? <laughs> so after me, how de body? De body fine. Very pleased to hear it. Currency in Sierra Leone is called the, um, Sierra Leone is actually two Portuguese words, which mean mountain lion. It had been a Portuguese colony at one time, but there's been a strong British presence there for many years now. And I think there's still an RAF base there. And all the young lads want to play football for Liverpool or Manchester United. Anyway, the currency is called the Leone. Notes vary in denomination from 500 to 10,000. This is a 5,000 Leone note, second highest denomination. And that's enough to pay a man's wages for a day. It's worth less than a pound. Would you work for a pound a day? No, nor would I. When we went out in 2005, not only did we have to pay our own way for get, to get out there and for our food and accommodation whilst we were there, not only did we go our services free of charge, 
But between us, the various teams of Rotarians had to raise enough money to pay for that extension, which, as you saw from June's photographs, quite a big building, 100 foot long, 30 foot deep, two stories high. And I did a bit of fundraising at the time, but I was conscious that I perhaps hadn't raised as much as I could have or should have. So when a return visit was planned for 2007, I thought, this is my chance to do some serious fundraising. So I decided to embark on a project which I had a 30% chance of failure. And somewhat more alarmingly for someone of my age, there's a one in 2,000 chance that I would die in the attempt. I don't, is anyone here in U3A? Any U3A members? Much to my surprise, I found myself on the front cover of the National Magazine. Oh. <laughs> to raise money for most of you, I did sponsor the climb of Mount Kilimanjaro. And that's me with Kilimanjaro in the background. Two very important things you need to know about mercy ships. First of all, it's a very cost-efficient charity. As I said, so many people are volunteers. There are some paid staff. An organisation this big, and it is multinational, has to have regular staff at an office that will always turn up. And, uh, you know, someone has to man the switchboard and the computer. Someone has to organise events, pay for publicity material, etc. But the overheads are kept to a minimum and independent auditors have confirmed that 90 pence out of every pound raised goes where it's needed. Compare this with some of the bigger national charities, they're only about 30 or 40 pence per pound. So most ships is a very cost effective charity. And also people get what you might call compassion overload and think, what's the point of throwing more money at Africa? It never goes where it's needed. Corrupt government officials cream off the proceeds, the man in the street gets nothing. Sadly, this is true, corruption is endemic throughout most of Africa. But of course, most of ships offers a service that can only go to those who need it. So not only is it very cost effective, it's 100% corruption proof as well. So you do know every, money, every penny raised for most of ships is going to be very well and very wisely spent. After I'd done Kilimanjaro, quite a few friends said, well, what are you going to do next? And I thought, well, people are willing to sponsor me. Uh, I'll always have a project in mind. And I decided to start walking some of the pilgrimage routes to Santiago de Compostela in northwest Spain. Now, it's become quite addictive. I've done 10 so far. And I'm doing another one in September with our local vicar from Lacey Green and hopefully another guy. And uh, again, it's all to raise money for mercy ships. There's a collecting box downstairs below and a sponsorship form. If you, there's absolutely no obligation at all, but if, you, if you'd like to support Messy Ships, uh, please do so. So I'll finish with this little story that happened on our first trip. It's about halfway through the trip. Now, I was working in the storeroom in the clinic, fitting some additional electrical points. Uh, I was doing the cabling and trunking. Another Rotarian, Peter, was fitting the switches to the cables and the English three-pin sockets like we've got here. I'm getting on quite well until Peter said he'd lost a little grub screw, about eighth of an inch long, tiny little brass grub screw, which clamps the switch to the cable. And without it, you can't complete the job. And, and if you work in electricity, you either do a proper job or none at all. It's too dangerous not to do anything properly. And, you know, we could go to B&Q and get another one. There's no b &Q. In fact, there's no shops as we know them. Lots of street trades and market stores, mm. not really any shops at all. So we started looking around the floor of the store and... Uh, we spent about a quarter of an hour, but we couldn't see any. The store was, floor was in an absolute mess. So Peter said he'd go in into one of the other rooms where he'd been working to see if he'd dropped it there. So he disappeared, and I was in the room on my own. And really, without thinking, I found myself saying, come on, Lord, this is a Christian charity. You're supposed to be helping us. And immediately I said those words, I knew <coughs> with absolute certainty I was going to find the grub screw. I looked down the floor, it was right next to my right foot. Mm. Anyway, that's the end of the talk. If you have any questions, we'd be glad to answer them. Thank you for listening. I don't know what, who it was who said it, but I once heard that someone said that just to be born in this country is for most people like having won the lottery. We're so privileged that we hardly realised you know, when I grumble that I can't see the doctor for the next two weeks, you know, you think of some of these poor folk in Africa and around the world um, where life is, is really, really hard. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, it, it is emotional. We can imagine what we would be feeling like if, 
it was one of our family who had the deformed lip or um, f foot going the wrong way. I was at college with a fellow, Bible college with a fellow whose foot had been born, his foot was upside down and back to front. And um, in the end, he had an amputated his heart, wonderful fellow. Um, but it was an obvious agony, agony. So praise the Lord for what's being done. Do praise the God that um, they gave, Mr. Stevens got that vision um, all those years ago now. I've got a feeling that Mercy Ships is probably going to go on to our regular agenda here. <laughs> mm -hmm.